Does this work? No. Uh, I didn't. I didn't test this. Let's just yeah. let's just do it manually. <laughs> hey, looks like we made it. Um, this is a map, of course, made using R. <laughs> no, I, that's a joke because I know there are plenty of people who are not using R in the audience, and I just wanted to see where everybody where everybody is coming from. Does this, do we actually have people from, from Groningen? Wow, welcome. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, there's uh, Zwolle. Um, so who, who's here uh, further than Groningen? Who comes from a, a place that's further from? From Greece, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, It kind of feels like Greece uh, now in the Netherlands, right? Amazing. Well, that only shows that th this group is, is truly hardcore. You've decided to, to, to come to TomTom Tom tonight and meet other people, learn about what um, yeah, other companies are doing when it comes to data science. I think that's, that's wonderful. So thank you all for being here. I just wanted to show this graph again. I showed it last time as well. Um, today, we actually passed the 2500 mark when it comes to members in the group. And I think that's a wonderful ac accomplishment as well. Of course, this meetup group has been around for a long time already, but um, it, it is going strong. All right, so for tonight's itinerary, um, in a moment, I'm going to shut up and give the floor to Tom. Tom. Uh, then we'll start with uh, the first talk by Vincent. Um, and then I'm not sure. It all depends on how the temperature in this room will be evolving. If things get really hot in here, then we'll just do a, um, a quick break so that everybody can get some more uh, refreshments. And we'll combine the two parts of the book raffle into one. Um, we'll see how things go, right? In any case, you will have three uh, interesting talks. So Vincent will be up first, then Roger, and last but certainly not least, Zainab. Um, just like last time, we'll uh, be doing community announcements. So that means that everybody um, will have the opportunity to stand up, say their name, and then make an announcement. So things like, I just graduated and I need a job, or hey, we got a vacancy come work for us. Or, hey, I'm working on this interesting open source project. Come and check it out. So anything that you think is, is interesting uh, to the rest of the community, that will be your opportunity. And after that, some more drinks, if you're interested. By 9.30, we have to leave the building. And that means that um, yeah, this, uh, the 11th Data Science and Meetup will come to an end. Uh, I have no date yet for the next one, for the 12th. Um, but if you just uh, keep checking your inboxes, then uh, yeah, we'll have to see how things go these, uh, these coming weeks. Oh, it does work. So now I would like to give the floor to Gijs Peters, location data scientist at TomTom. Tom. Thanks, give it up for Gijs. Well, thank you, and first of all, thank you very much all for being here. Very well, warm, very, very warm welcome to all of you. Um, I hope you've all been able to, to grab a cold drink and maybe a slice of pizza. Um, we have This afternoon we had a lunch and we were considering switching pizza for sushi because it was better maybe suited for this weather. I heard someone complain already that it didn't get salad. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I'm very glad you're all here, and I hope we'll survive this night and in, in that the air conditioning will keep us cool here. Um, so, first of all, uh, I want to thank Jeroen for organizing this event. Um, in the, I think the last week of April, he came to us and said, okay, I'm organizing these data science meetups, nice talks, book raffles, uh, we want to do it at your location. Uh, do you want to organize this? I said, yeah, sure, we'd love to. And then he said, could you do it in two weeks? Um, well, it's July now, so you know the answer. Um, so let's start about let's talk a bit about about TomTom. Tom. Um, it's great that you're here. 
Um, probably I fear that if I ask you as an audience, um, what do you think TomTom Tom does, you'll all say satellite navigation. Which is fine because we do. But we do so much more. Um, this is branding from a marketing department. We are the leading independent location technology specialist. We are one of the very few global map makers. Um, and we have a vision. It's a vision for a safe, connected, autonomous world, free of congestion, free of emissions. And we're all working very hard to do that. And we do that, of course, with our, our maps and our navigation. But we also make, make very real-time, very high-definition traffic products using um, latest stats, about 600 million permanently connected devices. And we're working very, very hard on our autonomous driving products, HD maps, road DNA, which I'm sure that Zainab will give a bit of a peek into later this night. So I won't uh, say everything she has to say. And only, only ask you for uh, one more uh, favor. We have some leftovers from the summer party. Some flip-flops there in the baskets and some bags to carry them. Please, when you leave, take a few for your next day at the beach. Um, that's it. Thank you again for being here. Uh, but I'd like to give the floor to either our MC, Jeroen. Yes, and then he will probably announce the first speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. And I think this is also an excellent moment to thank our host and sponsor for tonight, uh, Tom. TomTom. Of course, of course. So, our first speaker of tonight, Vincent Warmadam. He's going to explain to us how to steer clear. That was a joke. Oh, come on. This audience. <laughs> how to steer clear from artificial stupidity, stupidity or real stupidity, like the joke I just made. Um, Vincent. So we're, we're all kind of data science people and stuff, right? We're, oh, right. Yeah, mic is up, I think. The button, button. How about we give an applause for, for Vincent? <laughs> <laughs> so we're giving Vincent applause for finding the button. Well done. Um, <laughs> right, well done. Nah, so like, uh, first of all, this is, okay, this is going to be, can I give you a laptop back? Yep. Yes, because then I can read my screen as well. Um, so I just want to make like one sort of quirky announcement, because this is at TomTom. Um, Thank you, TomTom. Tom. Uh, I don't know if some of you went to the Pareto conference, but TomTom Tom was the official ball pit sponsor uh, this year. So like at the giant event, and then in the middle of it, we had one giant ball pit, uh, which was sponsored by folks at TomTom. Tom. I cannot thank you enough. The photos have been great. Having said that, I kind of want to talk about this other topic. Um, so the joke I kind of always make, uh, so like, what do you call it when people have like absolute faith in artificial intelligence? Does anyone know? Naive bias. Uh, uh, I know, it's a bad joke. Because artificial intelligence is like amazing and any lawyer will tell you. Um, so this is Twitter. Uh, there's an Irish guy called, uh, I believe you pronounce it, uh, Karen. Uh, and he's asking for a lawyer's advice. And essentially what happened, he did what any person would do who's trying to get like a car insurance. You go to the website, you try all sorts of buttons and see what gives you like the lowest rate for your insurance. Um, and the thing kind of was that he, you know, red car, you pay more. Turns out that this guy, um, when he filled in and he was born on a Sunday, he would end up paying more than if he was sort of uh, born on a Monday. Keeping everything else equal, he would pay more if he was sort of born on a Sunday. Uh, uh, and by the way, and he's asking for a lawyer. Um, so this is one of those moments that I have, that I would like to call sort of deep oops. Uh, and what I've started noticing is that deep oops tends to happen at scale. Uh, nowadays. And if you're not convinced by this example, I have another one. Um, and this was, I think, one of the demo moments, and this is one of those examples where that really do make me giggle. So this is PayPal's virtual agent. It's the chatbot, and it says, hi, I'm PayPal's virtual agent. To get started, simply ask me a question. I'm still learning, so if I can't help you, I'll direct you to any additional resources. Someone says, I got scammed, and the chatbot says, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny. Um, here's one that's not funny. Um, this, by the way, is a tweet that I got from Catherine Jarmel. If you're into fairness and that sort of thing, definitely follow her. She's great. Um, and apparently, what uh, this is sort of a, I believe it was The Verge who was reporting on this. I do forget. But uh, in the great state of, I believe, Oklahoma, I might be mistaken there, 
Um, thought it was a good idea to have an algorithm decide how much money you're supposed to get uh, for your healthcare. So people are insured, you have healthcare, and then at some point an algorithm will decide, okay, given sort of uh, things that you're uh, troubling you, how much uh, healthcare are you going to get? Um, so I'll just read two quotes from the lawsuit. Um, you're going to have to trust me that a bunch of smart people determined this is the smart way to do it, and... Negative changes, like a person contacting pneumonia, could counterintuitively lead them to receive fewer help hours because the flowchart-like algorithm would place them in a different category. Okay, so this is one of those algorithms, um, and like just like here before, I could I can kind of smell that this was sort of an automatically generated feature thing that went into a large grid search of cross validations and that kind of stuff, and it might be the thing that sort of started happening here as well. Um, but at this phase, I do think the only way for me to sort of look at this and judge this is to say, look, this is definitely artificial, but according to the Webster's textbook definition, this is also stupidity. This is definitely behavior that shows a lack of good sense or judgment. Uh, and I think we're going to see a whole lot more of this. Uh, artificial intelligence is amazing, especially if you're a lawyer. So what I would just like to talk about is just what I think might be remedies, not solutions, uh, to this artificial stupidity problem. Um, there's a couple of fixes I have in my mind. Uh, the first one is that probably we should just start predicting less, but we should do it carefully. Um, we should probably constrain the features we give to the model. This, this will really, really help. Um, like audio-wise, by the way, there's a bit of hummel. I don't know if someone can... Not too bad? All right, might just be me. All right. Uh, we can also constrain the model, which is epic. You're going to love that one. Uh, and what we can also do is just really do modeling. Uh, but unfortunately, I have to show you something that's very unfortunate, but rather fundamental to everything that we're doing, uh, which is a bit of a bummer, but it is the truth. So what do we typically do? Uh, typically, we're doing classification. And very typically, we probably use something like scikit-learn. Scikit-learn is great. We like scikit-learn. Uh, the way scikit-learn works in terms of classification, there's some sort of class where you can call predict proba, and predict proba will give you some sort of probability. And let's say that we're kind of worried. We want to be sure about our classification. Well, one thing that you do now is you just say, well, if it's above or below 50, you assign it to one class or another one. What you could also do is you can say, how about I don't do 50%, how about I do 90%? Right? That way, if it's class B, I might be more sure. And what you could even also do is say, oh, maybe I do something like this. And now there's no volume. No All right, well, this still works. It doesn't? No. Oh, yes. This still works? Yes. It does. All right. No, but this is something you can also do. So suppose that you want to say, hey, if it's class A, I need some certainty. If it's class B, it's some certainty. And otherwise, I just have this behavior that's called won't predict. And then you have the opportunity to sort of fall back. Um, essentially, what it kind of looks like is usually if, if you have a, like a class A or a class B, sort of when class A goes down, class B goes up, and sort of vice versa. What you might be doing to sort of prevent a whole lot of maybe stuff that happens you don't want is you can say, look, there's this region in the middle. I'm not going to do any predictions there because, you know, that's maybe a dangerous area. That's where I don't have certainty. This will go horribly wrong, and I'm about to explain why. So artificial data set. Uh, we have to uh, detect colors. It's either blue, green, or red. Um, and what I'll just do is I'll just apply the k-nearest neighbor algorithm, which you know, sure, we can argue it's not the best algorithm, but it's just a algorithm. Uh, and what I could do is I can uh, have it predict, and it will then probably yield something like this. So the overlap is sort of gone. You can clearly see the decision boundaries. So the algorithm will do something that goes from here onto here. And what I can then do is I can say only assign labels to where I'm really certain, where the probability is over 80%, which will then leave me with these points. These are then sort of the points that I'm sort of uh, ending up with. And again, this is sort of the starting point. For stuff that's sort of in the middle, we'll sort of do a fallback or something. Uh, but we could sort of argue this, these are more certain predictions. Now, remember that this was our starting point. And what I'm about to do in the next slide, these points are all going to become black. And you're going to see sort of the region where the decision is being made. So I'm going to show the decision boundary. And what you can see here is, you know, there's a couple of regions where we're uncertain. And there's regions where we are certain. The thick red means that the probability is very, very high. And if we zoom out, we can kind of see something that's going wrong. Because I don't know about you folks, but I'm having a really hard time assigning a large probability value to this region because I've never seen any data there. But the algorithm will just say, look, it's, it's probability near one. But it's insane to associate a high certainty there. And we're assigning a super high probability to regions where we have seen no data, and that's super wrong. And you might be going, oh, that's probably the algorithm. It isn't. Uh, logistic regression will do this for you. Um, random forest will do this for you. Deep learning will do this for you. And the thing here is, you should just always remember that predict proba is an approximation of probability 
at best. It might be a proxy, but it certainly is not a synonym for certainty. Uh, synonym? Synonym, sorry, dyslexic. And, and the main reason for this is, and people sometimes forget this, sorry, um, machine learning is designed for interpolation, not extrapolation. Um, what machine learning really just is, is finding like a good approximation for the mean. And the mean is really good at being the center number, not being around the edges. And here's a perfect example of that. And like this, this stuff is actually kind of relevant. I went to talk at Pyreta Warsaw, where this was sort of clearly explained. Um, suppose that we just, uh, this is from the use case here was when you're pregnant. I'm not the expert on this, but if you're pregnant, I've been told that they induce a hormone to help with the labor. Um, now, the research that decides how much hormones you get, I believe was from the 70s, and I believe it was done on like people from a young age group, between 21 and 25, I believe. Um, I do think that if you do that research and make an algorithm that makes this decision, this is a really dangerous statement, because it feels plausible, at least to me, that when you're 30, maybe your hormone levels are different, and you should probably get a different medicine. And this would be a whole lot safer if the algorithm was able to say, look, I'm not going to make a prediction about a region where I simply have not seen any data yet. So this is definitely one of those artificial stupidity things that can definitely go wrong. And it would be less of an issue if machine learning models weren't designed to always give a result. Um, I see a lot of stuff in production where there's no mechanism that assigns proper doubts to an outcome if a decision is made outside of a certain comfort zone. Luckily for us, though, uh, this last part of the problem is something you, just, you can just fix with some probability glue. Because, uh, again, this is a situation that we have. Well, what you can just do is t train a Gaussian mixture model on this, or some outlier detector or whatever. I just, I like Gaussian mixtures. Um, you fit some sort of likelihood bound, you put a quantile on the thing, threshold it, and you just say, look, anything that's in there, that I'm okay with. Anything outside of it, I'll just won't predict. This should catch a whole lot of stuff going wrong. And if you think, oh, that feels a bit limited, it's actually quite general. Because you can do the same thing with a neural network. Suppose I do some encoder-decoder stuff, and I set the stuff at the front uh, at equal. If a new sample comes in and it's outside of the comfort zone, also for a neural network on the latent state, I can just say, look, I won't predict here. This is uncomfortable to me. And the nice thing is, these latent states typically have this encoding where a GMM trains very well. No need to do variational inference. You can just probably get a GMM to train here. And I've done some experiments where it just sort of works. And what I think is super interesting about this, by the way, like, I don't know about you folks, but do you remember like five years ago when data science was different, that people said all these sort of rule-based systems are going to go away? I actually think they're going to come back. Because um, what's probably going to be happening now, you're still going to use machine learning as like building blocks for this. But at least to me, it feels very normal to maybe, if this is something in production, you maybe first have a step where you say, look, is this outside of my comfort zone? If it is, here's a fallback rule that might be general that I can apply safely. Is my model uncertain? Well, if, if it is sort of uncertain, then there's a different fallback scenario. But designing a system this way feels a whole lot safer with less things going wrong. And if nothing else, I mean, remember that the art here is to fail gracefully. Not predicting giving uncertainty is a great idea. And it's pretty easy to design a fallback mechanism and unit test all this stuff to make sure that some of these errors just don't happen. But be careful. Algorithms merely automate, approximate, and interpolate. And I think a whole, like, the big part of the problem isn't necessarily the algorithms, but just the fact that, like, mere humans of management might actually think that our models are actually supplying us with an actual probability, which is just plain wrong. It's an approximation. It's a proxy at best. And I understand that if you go to your employer and say, look, it's an approximate proxy, he or she will probably think you're really poetic or something. Um, but it's our job to care about the production layer. Uh, we shouldn't report on an AI miracle until we really understand when the model will fail. So probably we should be predicting less, but carefully. It's my first thesis, at least. But you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that can go wrong. And the analogy I kind of like to make here, like if I want to maybe reduce some other stuff that can go wrong, maybe it's time to put our models on a diet. Because if I think about it, maybe the stuff that I feed the model, it matters. And maybe my model should not be a cookie monster. Probably should be more like an Elmo. And I'll explain this with a bit of a controversial topic. Um, so we all know scikit-learn, and we've probably played with the Load Boston data set. Most online courses, uh, they use this load Boston data set as a simple regression exercise. The idea here is um, you might have a couple of rooms, you might be in a certain neighborhood, let's predict the price of a house. And then you, most people are taught to like, do the pipeline thing, pipeline, by the way, which is great. You have some sort of standard scalar, you do some sort of linear regression, fine. 
And then typically what Junior will do is they will come up to their boss and they will say, look, I've done kind of all right, uh, some sort of correlation. These are the predicted values and these are the actual values. Right, some sort of correlation, and we might convince ourselves that you know uh, a mean absolute error of three, uh, a deviation of three on top of 50 is kind of low, so we can convince ourselves that something went well here. Who can see the issue with this? Well, maybe. You can also look at the description of the data set, and then two of the columns are, one of them is the number of black people that live in your town, and the other one is, uh, I'll just loosely translate, the number of plebs that live there. This data set came from the 70s, when the world was, you know, not as politically correct as now, I could say. But here's the thing. You can sort of look at this chart and convince yourself that you're doing the right thing. But if you realize that this is sort of in your data set, you might be overfitting on something. It's not the trained test thing, but the cost function. I don't know about you, but I'm having a really hard time coming up with a use case where this sort of stuff isn't sort of pre-laundering, pre-existing bias, right? It gets worse. But first it gets better. So what I'm about to suggest is that we sort of fix this. We should maybe do something with fairness here. Before we do that, though, we should find a way to quantify fairness in this case. I will say fairness is like a huge topic, right? And there's many different aspects to this, and I'm just exploring this as, uh, uh, myself. But a definition, which is just merely a definition of fairness, there's many, is I could ex for at some point say, like, if my algorithm has uh, a different prediction for group A as opposed to group B, yeah, and group A and B can be like gender or whatever sensitive variable you want, but if I can measure that that is not equal to zero, then at least I have a signal that I'm being unfair in a way. I'm not fully fair yet, there's other things I should consider as well, but this is, if nothing else, a starting point. And what you would do is you would sort of do some bootstrapping, you take your group A predictions, you take your group B predictions, you do some bootstrapping sampling, and that difference, that's a proxy for unfairness. So I'm about to show you a trick, and the, and the hope is that this will go down. So the first thing that you could do is you could say, oh, I'll just delete the, uh, the, the sort of the sensitive variables from the data set. Not the worst idea, but I do hope that we acknowledge that that is extremely naive to think that then the problem goes away. Uh, probably this data set is biased to start with, so other things like income probably correlate a bit too much with these variables that we're throwing away. So just removing the columns isn't enough. But there's this other trick that you can do from linear algebra. So in linear algebra, you have this notion of projections. So you can sort of say, here's a vector. I'm going to project that onto another vector or away. And one thing that you could do is you could say, look, there's this one projection that is sensitive, VB in this case. I'm just going to make sure that my other vector, VA, is projecting away from it. Um, so that's the trick. It's kind of like gram schmidt process for the math people here, but it's a little bit different because you're not doing this on every single column. You're just filtering away the information um, uh, from the two sensitive columns in this case, because I only have two sensitive columns. This is the trick, so let's just look at the effect. Um, first, I'm going to demonstrate the normal situation. Then I'll show you the situation with two dropped columns. And then I'll show you the situation with the information filter. And to judge how that works, um, this is sort of the mean squared error chart. So this is just what we predict what's actually truth. So that's sort of how accurate is our model. And this is the proxy for unfairness. And I would just like to point out in this data set, um, this is like 12 points of unfairness. And the house price has like 50 points. So an unfairness of 12 is like a pretty sizable portion of the house price. Like, it's something we should be concerned with. So I'm about to switch, and you're going to see what happens when I drop two columns. The orange is sort of the new situation. And we see it's actually moving more towards zero, so that's a good thing. But statistically, we're nowhere near. Here's what happens when I do the information filter. You know, it's still not perfectly zero, but we're getting near significance at this stage, so that's a good thing. But you do notice that this guy is suddenly a whole lot worse. Pay attention, though, because the way it's worse is interesting. Because the predictions where it's bad at is at the lower segment. The stuff that's in the upper segment is going fine, but the stuff in the lower segment, that's suddenly where the skew is. Which tells us something about bias in this data set. Like, being able to see that is actually kind of interesting. And the thing here is, you might be worried now that, you know, you have the spectrum where on one side you got more accuracy, the other one you got more fairness, right? Um, and you can sort of, you know, imagine this is kind of unfortunate because I, yeah, I don't expect corporate incentives to align here. I'll be saying that nicely. But you shouldn't despair too much because one thing you could do 
and she can look at the skewness and fairness in the base prediction. So this is the prediction from the best model we have. And this is the difference between the accurate model and the unaccurate model. And you know, there's definitely like a pattern here. This is like predictable. So also here you can come up with a rule that says if the unfairness is just too big, fall back, don't make a prediction, have a human look at it. So again here, we're able to design something. It won't solve everything, but at least it's a good proxy to prevent artificial stupidity. And it goes beyond just checking for accuracy. But here comes the issue with it. So first of all, like fairness is sort of in the eye of the beholder, right? So different people might have different opinions on what fair actually means. But there's a worse problem. I like this trick. But in order to apply this trick to cost fairness with regards to income and skin color, I need to know the income and skin color, because otherwise there's no way for me to correct on this, which suggests that fairness might come at the cost of privacy. And my way of thinking about that is that it might be a bargain, if you really consider it. Because, um, let's be cynical, it is possible that you have third parties now sort of saying, we aren't allowed to know your gender, kind of as an excuse to not apply any form of fairness. Mm -hmm. Um, and as we saw before, imagine now I had the same data set, but those two sensitive columns weren't in there. I would silently still have unfairness in my data. There would be no way for me to correct that. And, you know, do I trust people with my data is definitely sort of a conversation. But the awkwardness is, without me giving this, it's going to be hard for me to retrospectively check if the model is fair at all. If you see a solution for this, like, definitely tell me. But I think this is sort of a, the fundamental problem here. Because, you know, fairness is uh, beholder stuff. That said, also here, this trick you can also do on the latent state of a neural network. Um, I've done some experiments with natural language processing. Uh, like the, the, the man, woman, king, queen thing, it doesn't hold for all sorts of things. If you say, I want to have a sandwich minus tomatoes plus tacos, you're not going to get like stuff you put on a taco. But for gender, it does seem to be a bit prevalent. This is a way where you can sort of say, look, there's man, woman, there's king, queen, Let's make that orthogonal, and the resulting vector space should have less bias. Yeah, not going to be perfect, but at least something you can try to maybe address this. The variables that you put into your system and how they are processed, I think, are more defining of the end result than whatever machine learning algorithm you'll end up using. I like seeing modeling pipelines where you explicitly, exclamation point, Select columns from a data frame because it should be a fundamental part. I don't like seeing people just put X and Y and then do cross-validation. I want you to consciously decide what columns you're using because otherwise this stuff will go wrong. And if understanding what goes out of your model matters, then so does the stuff you put in. It's just a fundamental relationship. There's no way around it. So it's our responsibility to consider this. <sighs> How much time do I have? I'm okay on time. Okay, good. I was going to have a beer, but, but important stuff. But, um, but now that I've discussed some stuff you could do like heuristically, let's maybe now talk about fundamentals, because I, I will admit this is going to be my main interest in the next couple of years. Because maybe we've been designing this stuff wrong. Um, and I'll just give an example from operations research. So um, suppose that I'm optimizing a portfolio of stocks, like, like actual stocks. So I can buy stocks in Apple, and, and not like actual apples, but the company. Um, X here is the number of stocks that I buy, or like whatever percentage of my budget, and R is the return that I get back. I can optimize this, but I hope we all agree that solve it, like optimizing this, making this number as high as possible, is a bit silly, unless we consider this constraint. I, I, sh I should never go over budget. It's ridiculous to even calculate this without having this constraint in there. Uh, what would also be silly is to do that without this. I probably have some sort of risk preference that I shouldn't go over. And the thing is, like, you might be saying, look, you add a constraint, but that means that your maximum profit is, go is going to get lower. And I would say, yeah, but I don't care, because the application just improved a whole bunch. But then if I look at stuff that we're doing in machine learning, we're always just, cons like, to the most insane Kaggle extent, we're just trying to like, make the accuracy as high as possible and, and just optimize one sort of metric without being able to add any constraints whatsoever. And that feels flawed. It feels like we're overfitting on the cost function in that sense. It seems more interesting to just design systems where you add constraints. And the thing is, there's actually a couple of constraints we can already add to these systems. Um, and I'll discuss three. One of them is monotonicity, the other one is fairness, and the other one are label guarantees. Um, so what does monotonicity mean? 
Well, to put it in math, uh, suppose that f is the machine learning algorithm that I'm considering. I might be able to say something in the line of, if you smoke more, you should be less healthy. Any model that doesn't have that is wrong, so I can just add it as a constraint. Meaning that there's one column that should have one and only one type of relationship with y, namely monotonically increasing or decreasing. A example of that is if you just have one axis, you just say, look, um, whatever value i that's lower than j, um, the prediction for that value should be lower. And what you then get is something that's already in scikit-learn, namely isotonic regression. And it sort of looks like this. You have one axis, and the relationship can only go up or it can go down. And you might be wondering, when does this matter? Well, for starters, suppose you got some sort of data set with a weird outlier in there. Suppose that that person's a chain smoker, but also a millionaire who can get the best doctors in the world. Then you don't want to train a random forest and get this. If you add a monotonicity constraint, you get this. And it's still not perfect. You can probably get a slightly more accurate model if you delete the outlier. But at least now, we've guaranteed some form of safety. We will never sort of break our monotonicity rule because it's a constraint of the system. And you might be wondering, like, is this limited to simple models? Well, first of all, simple models aren't limited. And second, no, you, there's tons of stuff that does this. So there's this package called TensorFlow Lattice. They do a bunch of cool tricks. Uh, but one of them is that they can guarantee monotonicity. The idea is that uh, whatever block you have in your neural network that get, receives monoton monotonic inputs should coincidentally also have monotonic outputs. And by doing that, you can actually guarantee that the relationship from your X to your Y is either up or down, but not swiggly in between. XGBoost also has this, and you only have to go to the documentation page where I copied this chart from to find out. Here's a system without monotonicity constraints, and here is one with. XGBoost has this, you just have to turn on the switch. But if we're so focused on getting our accuracy right, you're not going to sort of notice these sorts of features. And I will argue, features like this can also improve your test scores, certainly, but moreover, they can add safety to your system. And since we're on the topic before, how about we do a similar thing for fairness? I can imagine that maybe I have some information about the human race, and maybe I have some information about the human gender, and I can argue that in a lot of cases, I don't want to have any bias based on those sensitive variables. Now, it gets a bit mathy, but for logistic regression, what you could do is you can say, I have these sensitive columns, and I want the distance between that column and the uh, decision boundary uh, to be kept at bay. That's a way of formulating fairness. It's definitely an approximation. Um, but what you can do, um, and you know, a colleague of mine implemented this, it was really fun to build, actually, is you can add some sort of fairness coefficient, and you can have uh, sort of this linear system, then say, look, if I want the fairness to be at a certain level, um, then I'm still optimizing the best accuracy, but I'm constrained on this. So this is essentially a system that says, given a certain level of uh, fairness, find the best accuracy, but don't compromise on the fairness. Um, I have two other colleagues, uh, Stein and Hank, and they kind of made a neural variant of, the, of this. Freaking hipsters. Um, <coughs> so the idea is still kind of cool, but the idea is you have some sort of X, and this is something you want to predict accurately, but you don't want this to correlate with sensitive columns, so to say. So what you could do is you can say, I have some sort of normal classifier and some sort of adversarial, and I'll just have a cost function where if I can predict this very well, that's good. But if this metric can sort of predict these very well, that will be bad. So then the cost function is make this as high as possible, so make this as low as possible, make that as high as possible. And this introduces a system that still gives you balance. Now, it's not a, it's not a hard guarantee, but you can sort of look, uh, this is a pretty GIF that you can also find in our blog. But the idea is that it searches, uh, the probability rules of fairness, they increase, and the accuracy so slightly decreases, but the distribution between the sensitive uh, attributes is sort of kept at bay. And it might just be exactly what you want. And it's not even that you're sort of delivering too much on accuracy either. It might be just a couple of percentage points, but that's a bargain compared to the fairness you're going to get back. And again, you're not going to get here if the only thing you're focusing on with you know, the Kaggle instance is this loss function. But I would argue if I'm designing a system, that's probably not super interesting compared to the other stuff. And this is something that I think you can also do. You can also add like, proper constraints for detection. And what that essentially means is, sure, I want to optimize for loss and stuff in general, but there's a couple of instances, they have to be predicted correctly. It's a guarantee. I must predict those correctly. Nothing else can happen, but those have to be predicted correctly. It's a constraint now. And 
my favorite way of thinking about it, and I actually think this is kind of cute. So when I'm watching Netflix, I don't want to get recommendations from my girlfriend's shows, and my girlfriend doesn't want to get recommendations from my stuff. It would be epic if I could tell Netflix not just here's the data of stuff that I watch, but Netflix, here's a constraint. I, the user, tell you that you're not allowed to recommend me this stuff anymore. Add this constraint to your system. This way, you're giving a user the opportunity to not just sort of give data, but also customize the algorithm, which is what you're trying to do in the first place. And like numeric issues aside, when you think about models this way, a whole new beautiful world opens up. I don't know about you, but when I started thinking about it this way, like I envision rainbows and like lions hugging zebras and green hills and stuff. Like this is really cool stuff you can do because instead of overfitting our design concerns like AUC or RUC, we can actually design systems by thinking. And I don't know about you, but designing is actually kind of nice. I am kind of tired of doing like fit predict in the machine learning model and hoping everything will run. And the best metaphor I kind of have for this is like, when I look for clothing, I try to look for clothing that fits me. Um, when I see a t-shirt that I really like, it's really, really fundamentally useless to me, unless it fits me. And just like a bespoke suit, there's no better Vincent that will fit that suit, but there is a better suit that will fit this Vincent. And I do think that design approach is a whole lot better. Because it does feel like this sometimes, that I'm looking at people just doing fresh out of college, just to do fit predict a whole bunch, this is what you'll end up with. Just a whole bunch of sort of standard suits that might fit one guy, but definitely won't fit everyone. And I'll kind of be making a statement here that maybe we should be going away from model that fit and maybe more towards something like tailored up model. Because when you're tailoring a model, there's less unexpected issues. You have the opportunity to design a system that's highly articulate to the sort of problem that you're trying to solve. You can also very easily answer questions about assumptions without resorting to like mere metrics. And there's actually kind of a common theme to all this. Because, you know, if you think about it, a model is nothing more than whatever constraints you have from your domain knowledge multiplied by stuff you learn from data. And that's kind of interesting, because if you think about it, this prior that you have on your model, that's a constraint. Typically, you can say there's regions where I think the prior should be zero, henceforth, we should never have a model there. And just like a bespoke suit, maybe we need to accept that calling model that fit is incredibly naive, and maybe we should start doing what people do in physics. Because um, a physicist will look at a system, and they won't try to just predict they mainly try to understand. And I'll just ha I have one final example of this, and I kind of want to show you the, both the beauty and stuff that will still go wrong, but let's consider one final data set that involves chickens. It's my favorite data set for training. Uh, the idea is as follows. So these are like the averages across all the different diets, and every dot you see here is a chicken. And there's a couple of chickens that over time they gain a bit of weight, they, they gain a bit of variance. Um, but the idea is we would like to be able to predict the weight of the chicken because, uh, you know, the butchering industry is sort of interested in that. And what people will typically do, and this is what happens if you put a deep neural network on it, by the way, is it will make like a one-hot encoded variable for the diet, chug it in, and you get something like this. But this, you know, the, uh, the lines are not the predictions, by the way. But I hope we agree that this is fundamentally wrong because if a chicken is born, if a model says that depending on the diet, when you're born, you have a different weight, that makes no sense, because the effect of the diet happens after you had your first meal, not before it. So fundamentally, I can already say, this model is just wrong. And what I can then do is I can sort of think about the problem. And, you know, you typically do it with a whiteboard and a coffee. Um, you can sort of say, you know, by looking at the mistake I'm making here, maybe I should just say I have some sort of intercept that's the same for all the chickens, but the slope, that's a thing that's different for each diet. And getting this into scikit-learn is actually kind of tricky. Especially when I look at this image and I kind of notice that this sort of the deviation is also increasing over time. So then I might want to expand this idea such that you know, the variance also increases over time, but that also depends on the diet. Now, so you've got this awesome tool called PyMC3 where you can sort of estimate all these parameters. And I'll just demonstrate what it's like to do PyMC3 again. So this is the sigma over time per diet. This is the uh, sort of growth per diet. There are apparently R2 diets that have a very high rate per time step, but one of them has a much lower sigma. Like, 
this feels like a conversation I'm sort of having with my model. I'm sort of doing hypothesis tests as I'm sort of training this stuff. And scikit-learn will not give you this level of depth or this ability to have a conversation with your model. And I also get uncertainty estimates, which means that I can make a prediction with sigma around it telling me how certain or uncertain I am about my prediction. And, you know, I know about you, but these models are perfectly explainable because, again, you literally model them. You have way more options to ask what if types of questions. You can even do like hypothesis tests with them because I can ask is this a significant difference or is it not? And you might consider that human bias is a downside, and I guess it will be kind of okay and fair. But the main downside is something that's way worse. Because as you're building this model, you will not discover that some of these chickens die prematurely. You only do this, you only find this out if you're sort of doing analysis in the data set. But the thing here is, a couple of these chickens, they die kind of early. We, you don't know why, it might be because of the diet. But the model is not taking this into account in any way or form, unless I notice it. And unless I can tell the model this is something that we should take into account. And every model has this problem. So this entire talk I've, I've kind of spent talking about like side effects of our models that go unnoticed if we're not careful. But to emphasize the main point, even what I would call the best model, uh, they can totally fail if we don't understand the problem that we're trying to solve. Because, you know, we might be building a system that produces dead chickens, if you're not careful. If you automate this stuff, you're going to maybe get this result. You know, beware of the lawyers. But there are some remedies. I think maybe predicting less is a great way to remove risk, but be careful about your definition of certainty. Um, I also think that constraining features is actually kind of a nice thing to do. Uh, optimality goes a lot further than ROC, AUC, or MSE. Or, uh, yeah, but maybe just saying, look, model, you're not allowed to fit on this sort of stuff, that's actually not a bad idea. We should probably consider models that constrain. I think they're great. And a great way of sort of mentioning that is by just taking account something of a prior. And that allows you to design Bayesian systems which in general are way more articulate and you should try them. But most importantly, take a step back and think about what you're doing. Beware the dead chickens, because they are there. Natural intelligence isn't such a bad idea. Please grant yourself the freedom, creatively, to understand the problem, because I think this will help you a great deal in designing the solution. If you're looking for inspiration, there's a really cool checklist called Dion. Just Google that, Dion Data Science. It's a really cool checklist of stuff that might go wrong. You can tick that off, and, you can put, and then there's a banner for your README that confirms that you've thought about it. But there is one more thing I just want to mention, um, and that is that I've sort of noticed uh, that whenever I give a talk, I have these people mention, oh, those are great ideas, Vincent, but it's really hard to apply the maths because, you know, I'm just not really there yet. And I do kind of recognize that um, if you're sort of new to this, uh, maybe building this math stuff yourself is kind of hard. So I'm happy to announce that on behalf of GoDataDriven, Driven, we've open sourced some of our internal uh, scikit-learn tools into a project called Scikit Legos. It's uh, been a bit annoying. I saw some of my colleagues implement and reinvent the wheel over and over and over again. Um, but some of the stuff we've now consolidated in an open source package. The fair classifier you saw before is in there. The information filter you saw before is in there. The thresholding trick is also in there, and we would love for everyone to play with that. Uh, meet us on GitHub. Um, we're also very interested in ideas that come from the community, so if you have a really cool idea, we might just want to implement it. Um, this is already in production at a few clients of ours. Uh, do let me know, and uh, let me know if you want to have stickers. Thanks. Thank you, Vincent. So I stiffed, eh? Yeah, right on time. Oh. But I still want to give the audience the opportunity to ask a question or two, if there are any. There's certainly a lot of food for thought. I don't know if anyone has been able to articulate a question already. Yes. So, uh, in your example of fairness, you took something where everybody has domain knowledge, right? So, like, sex, religion, race, and then you have some kind of things where... Well, I would argue not everyone has that, but yes. <laughs> Right, so um, it's funny you say this. So I was listening to 99% Invisible yesterday, and there was a woman there who sort of had a great story about uh, unfairness in driving, actually. Uh, I'm just going to mention the audiobook I'm, I'm currently listening to. It's actually kind of great. Uh, Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. Uh, one of the examples they had is in Sweden, they do this snow shoveling. 
Um, and, you know, this is policy stuff as well, right? But uh, you can do snow shoveling on like the car roads. Technically though, those are usually like the fellas going to work who use those roads. The pavement itself doesn't get cleaned. And if you consider that, you know, people are walking around with their stroller, that's kind of hard to do and they might slip. Um, they actually kind of found out that most of the accidents, most of the victims of traffic accidents during winter in Sweden were all women because they were sort of driving the toddlers around. Um, this is sort of a example out there. Um, there's probably lots of these. The thing is, I'm a guy and I'm kind of probably blind to most of this stuff. Um, also, I think this privacy thing is also going to be a bit of a painful thing because you probably need to know the gender of all your drivers to sort of know if you, your software is doing the right thing. I, I can imagine in general a car is probably designed for a guy, just like the ergonomics of it, like the height and that sort of stuff. So I can come up with all sorts of biases here. Uh, the main point I want to make here though is it's not all about the accuracy. It's usually other stuff you want to constrain as well because that's what makes the system interesting. Um, another thing you can do with this, by the way, with the information filter, if you're into fraud, um, it might be that certain types of fraud are just very easy to detect. And if you focus on those, you're leaving a giant blind spot for the fraud cases that are harder to detect. So you might want to say, I want to have a classifier that's as good as detecting both types, because otherwise I might have a blind spot which is going to get uh, utilized. If you're able to stare blindly, I think that's a joke on its own. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, the, yeah, the system like, accuracy is just a metric, and it shouldn't be that special of a citizen. Yeah. Yes. You already are. Um, how do you master models? So, for instance, initially you didn't know about some patterns, for instance, because maybe they didn't exist in your dataset or some bias. Well, so in the example that I have there, suppose that those two columns didn't exist. Yeah. That would be, I would not have become aware of the issue. And that's the issue. Yeah, so I, I'm more interested, for instance, when you have like real time data processing, so you sure. didn't know exactly the thing in your data set that you had initially for your analysis about those patterns, but mm -hmm. that happening maybe afterwards. Well, so, so the thing that, that is, uh, you, you do have some issues there that, that I don't have, right? But if nothing else, at least attempt the hindsight thing. And if, it might be that in hindsight you find out, ah, it's this one pattern that keeps occurring that's causing all the bias. Maybe tackle that. But uh, like real time is trickier than, uh, than hindsight. Hindsight's kind of easy because you just try everything out on an offline data set. Now, if, if I know more about your use case, then I might be able to steer you more. But uh, in yeah. real time typically is trickier. Yeah, so one thing we did, uh, so I w had a gig at the flower auction, and, <laughs> okay, it's actually kind of funny, so you had, you, had, you had these people, right, and they check photos, and the question we asked them in the beginning was sort of, is this a good photo? And then five people say yes, and five people say no. <laughs> you know, they disagree with one another, and that's kind of normal. Um, and I think people who label, that's a human thing, so there's bound to be errors in it. Um, one thing there, maybe don't take a quantifiable, attempt there, but just talk to these people <laughs> and get the conversation going and make sure that that feedback loop also exists sort of on a qualitative level. Make sure the people that, you know, maybe participate in the day are labeling. That's usually a, a pretty good thing to do anyway. Yeah. One more question. So this is kind of one of those language things where I guess in our field there's like many definitions that are different but mean the same thing and there's like a word that's the same that can mean different things. So like with machine learning, am I teaching the machine or is the machine teaching me? Um, but I will say modeling, like the historical thing there, is that you model something so that you understand the system. And machine learning is sort of predicting. Historically there are also sort of physical models that were useful by the way but wrong. And I do want to emphasize, they were useful. I think the first sort of stargazing people who were trying to traverse the ocean, you know, they, they still made it. Um, but especially in an age where we're sort of automating all this sort of stuff, we might get deep oops at scale. And that I do want to prevent, because, you know, this was the, 
healthcare thing, that's kind of scary. We should probably not do that. And it is possible, so. Let's uh, thank Vincent for his wonderful talk. Thank you.